this segment really really fits in really well with this whole discussion that we're having um and it also has to do with optics um and it's it's the question of dugan like who is dugan alexander dugan you some of you may have heard the name before like i think while he was known in the past few years uh increasingly in the west like his name is the, a the only the now. only dugan i know is hacksaw yeah. jim Hello. sorry yeah. no it, Ale, not, that's that, alexander dugan that's infrared's dad right so that is... that. <laughs> uh, it should be we should, we should uh think about adopting him as a father to be honest but anyway mm -hmm. so dugan so th there's two realities of dugan one is how the western ruling class sees dugan and how like what dugan actually like, has to say so the west portrays dugan as quote unquote the brain of putin if you see articles coming out of like ruling class media that's how they'll portray him and it's like this very mm -hmm. orientalist thinking like you know, this kind of crazy dictator who's ruling the country has this evil mastermind behind him. Like, yeah, he's Putin's do, right? Rasputin. Yeah, exactly. That's what I, I saw. Right. The... And if you, if you like, quickly look, look him up on Wikipedia or something, right, you'll see things like fascist. If you mention his name on Twitter, like, dismiss as fascist. But, like, how many people actually understand what his ideology is? Um, and his ideology is very interesting. Um I'm always interested to see how people in other countries and other parts of the world think, because we live in such an ideological bubble. Like in the West, we really have liberalism idea as an ideology and this kind of very basic, naive version of Marxism. Um, but, you know, th the rest of the world has a lot of thinking. For, for example, um, it's the child collective recently translated like a social media article from China uh, kind of talking about the political situation there. And it's, it was always interesting, um, like hearing the perspectives of Chinese people. Like, you know, Chinese people have social media, they have, you know, their posters too. They're, they're also having political debates and yelling at each other. Yeah. And it's, if, and if it's, anybody go like, if you go on WeChat, like you'll find out pretty quickly that there's no uniformity of chat whatsoever. In, right. Exactly. In China whatsoever. Yeah. Exactly. And because a lot of it's not translated, it's difficult to understand what debates are actually having. So, you know, for us uh, as, as thinkers in the West, we should be thinking about, you know, what debates are they having in China or Russia or anywhere else or in, in Iran? Like, what thinkers are they drawing from? In these no, debates? Only America has internal politics debates. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the people that they're drawing from in their ideological debates, like, could they be useful for our thinking as well or for the thinking of a world's theory in general? Because, um, like, what Americans like to do is take a theory developed inside of America and, like, apply it to the rest of the world rather than understanding that other parts of the world have different views like over things. Um, another example I can think of uh, on this topic is the question of like nuclear weapons in Iran. Like the West will say that Iran is developing we weapons. Uh, liberals will say that Iran should not be developing weapons, right? Because we should denuclearize. But you know, how many know that um, the debates around nuclear weapons in Iran largely are around the question of Islam? where um, the dominant idea in Iran is right now is that while nuclear weapons would be useful for deterring imperialism, nuclear weapons are not allowed under Islam because they're too destructive, right? Like these are the kinds of debates and ideology, ideologies that we should be understanding if we want a better, better view of the world. Now, Alexander Dugin is a very influential, think, influential thinker in, in Russia. Um, and he his ideology or the it's not his specific ideology right but it's an ideology that he's writing about but this ideology really i think emerges in a in a specific historical moment in russia collapse of the soviet union happens um and then there's like that destructive liberalization that happens in russia that ruins the lives of people and then people are suddenly anti like liberalization um, but the Soviet Union also fell. So, like, what comes next, right? While there is a revival of communist thinking in Russia, there's also other, like, solutions to the liberalization that happens that comes in the West. And, and a large part of that is what Dugin is putting forward as a theory. Um, so before I kind of go into his theory, I also want to describe, like, how Western leftists are viewing Dugin. So obviously, uh, as I'll explain, like, what his thoughts actually are, his thoughts are very... I think, scary for the ruling class of the West. Um, his, um, to, I'll go into it in detail, but in, in short, his thoughts are basically that uh, Russia should be independent, right? Just, just as the ideology behind Iran or, or China is. 
so this is obviously scary to the to the West because the West wants to integrate Russia into its into its sphere. Um, so, you know, the popular think the popular understanding of Dugin then becomes fascist because that's coming from the ruling class. To them, he is a fascist, and then the Western left just parrots like whatever they say, right? And even if it is true that he is a fascist, like let's just assume he's a fascist. You know, Kwame Ture talked about like studying your enemy. Like fascists would be our enemy too, right? And like Kwame Ture, for example, insisted on studying Hitler to understand like what did Hitler think versus what did the schools teach us on what Hitler thought, right? Like schools thought, taught us that Hitler was anti-Semitic. But, you know, like if you actually read Hitler, you'll also, you'll know that he's anti-Semitic, but yeah. on top of that, he's anti-Marxist, right? Like he ties communism and Marxism and, and labor politics to Judaism. Right? That, that's like something that's left out of the education. And that's something that you'll really capture if you actually go and study him. So, all right. So, so the, the, the end point here is that if Dugan's a fascist, we should study him to understand the enemy. If Dugan is not a fascist, we should study him simply on the basis of him being so important inside Russia. Um, so China, it seems like yeah. even if you're like, OK, this is Putin's like like the, the brains behind Putin. It's like, well, then yeah, study him. <laughs> would want to know what the brains behind Putin is thinking then. Right. 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 But it, 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 like we're in this culture like this. I mean, we were just talking about this like right, left, ridiculous culture where if you share something by him, one, you're demonized as right wing, even if you may not agree with what he's saying. Um, and then you, you'll be, you know, a labeled a platformer of Dugan. Um, so China studies Dugan. Uh, CGTN had a inter uh, long interview with him a few years ago. Um, I saw that they're recording one with him right now again. I think Dugan is very important for China to study simply because of, you know, what I'll get into in, in his ideology. Um, so there's a great, um, there are great interviews with him. Well, I see those interviews are not so great, in my opinion. The interviews could be better. But there are some great articles on him from China that I've read, and I'll link into the chat later. But before we get into Dugan's ideology and his thinking, I kind of wanted to share uh, a clip of Kwame Ture. Because Kwame Ture, um, so in, in this clip, he talks about um, Pan-Africanism, but he uses historical materialism to explain Pan-Africanism. And I want us like in this mindset before we actually talk about Dugan. So Stu, can you play yeah. that clip of Kwame? Yeah, it is. Thanks. Ready to go. Europe. Europe everywhere speaks of European continental unity. Even though Europe has fought more fratricidal wars than any other continent or all the continents put together, Europe still speaks of European continental unity. Of course, Africa will unify before Europe, but that's not the point of discussion here this evening. The fact that Europe, with all the fratri fratricidal war she has fought, can speak of continental unity shows this evolutionary process. Africa, like any other society, anywhere in the world, was involved in this same evolutionary process, going from family to tribe to clan to nation to continent. This evolutionary process was interrupted by European imperialism. Can you pause right there really quick? Yeah. Slavery and... Um, everything else Kwame is going to have to say, I think also relates, but I wanted to make one point here. Kwame says that the historical development of Africa was interrupted by, by the West. Um, Nkrumah once said that if Africa was allowed to develop without interruption, it, it would have been the first uh, continent to reach socialism. I don't know how true that is or not, but we were never able to find out, right? Because their historical development was interrupted. And one of the key premises out of Dugan's thought is the same thing, that Russia's historical development as a, as a nation and a, as a people was interrupted um, by the West. And I'll get into that more as a whole, but let's continue with Kwame. Okay. Colonialism. First, they took over 300 million, the strongest out of Africa, and then they divided Africa at the Berlin Conference. So you can see that Africa herself was moving on this evolutionary process. This evolutionary process, which would lead to continental unity, and Africa will still be the first continent unified, was interrupted by European capitalism. Since it was interrupted by European capitalism and evolutionary process, the only way that Africa can unite today is through a revolutionary process aiming at a socialist economy. If capitalism destroyed us, it doesn't make sense to use capitalism to continue with it. We must use the 
anti antithesis of capitalism, which of course is socialism. And certainly if an evolutionary process has been interrupted, the only way we can capture the time lost is through a revolutionary process. We state these facts only to let you know that those of us who are revolutionary, pan-Africanists, is not because we love revolution, it is historically determined and we have no alternative but to follow history and to use history for the benefit of our people. So this then is the general outlines of pan-Africanism, so you must not think that Africanism just began. Had Africa been left untrampled by European imperialism, we would have a long time achieved uh, continental unity. Secondly, pan-Africanism must be seen as a movement, a mass movement. And this mass movement must be properly understood. Africa, of course, because of racism, is belittled everywhere. And many people do not see Africa's constant, constant, underline the word constant, contributions to uh, world civilization. In the, since the 1940s, Africa has given, even before the 1940s, actually, we can go back to the Honorable Marcus Garvey, Africa has given to world political movements a mass character. Africans revolt in masses, never as a vanguard party. If you look at the independence struggle in Africa, it was nothing less than mass. If you look at the struggle in the Caribbean for independence, it was nothing less than mass. And even in the United States of America, the only movement they call a mass movement is our movement. Therefore, this mass character must be properly understood. Pan-Africanism has this mass character. Africans have this mass character in responding. And our responsibility is to bring this mass character together make it precise so that it can direct its blows at the enemy, hitting him, hitting him, hitting him until we knock him down. Therefore, the, the task of Pan-Africanism is to gather the masses of our people together in the same organization, irrespective of where they find themselves, be it in Europe, be it in the United States, be it in the Caribbean, or be it in Africa. This is the first aspect then we must understand. Pan-Africanism found its organizational expressions in 1900. Here, a Pan-African conference, here the word conference, was organized by Africans from all over the world. They came together deciding that something must be done for Africa. The, one of the leading organizers of this uh, conference was a man by the name of Henry Sylvester Williams, born in Trinidad, a man whom you should do some history on, a very, very great man. Uh, Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois attended the conference, but he was not one of the leaders in 1900. By 1917, 1918, uh, the idea of a necessity for a Pan-African uh, Congress, not conference, Congress, was to be called. But most of the people who did the conference were dead. And Mr. Vester Williams was dead. A lot of them were dead. Du Bois was about the only one who was alive. Du Bois recognized he had a historic responsibility to continue the work of Pan-Africanism. So he called the first Pan-African Congress, make a clear distinction. The first one in 1900 was a conference. Du Bois being intelligent, understanding that a conference is limited and a Congress has more elasticity and can go longer, call it a Pan-African Congress. I think we can pause it here. Uh, All right. The main point I wanted was, was, was across. So um, I think Kwame Ture very clearly uh, positions Africa as like a whole civilization, like Africa as a continent is its own civilization. It has different nations, it has different peoples, different ethnic groups, but it, ha it is a civilization that needs to be unified, right? Um, so Dugan has a, a similar thinking, and obviously the Soviets also had a similar thinking, and you can you can call that thinking pan-Russianism. Um, so there's this idea called um, Eurasianism, um, and it, it really just means that Russia is not European, and Russia is not Asian, and Russia is kind of like sitting in the middle of these two continents as its, as its own identity, as its own empire, as its own, like, just people, as its own civilization. And Dugan, like his main criticism, uh, like I guess the main facet of his theory is that there is a very destructive force that exists in our world right now. He points to uh, Atl the Atlantic group, which is like the US and Western Europe, that go around disturbing the development of different civilizations. And he points, he points to the Persian civilization, so Iran. He points to ch the Chinese civilization. He points to the Russian civilization, and obviously the African civilization. Um, and I, I find a lot of parallels with what um, Kwame Ture says. Now, the, there are obviously differences between what Kwame Ture and what Dugan think and say. Kwame Ture is a communist. He's a Marxist-Leninist. And the Dugan, Dugan is of what he calls the fourth political ideology. Um, fourth meaning um, not liberal, not fascist, not communist. He sees these three ideologies as failures, um, especially in the case of uh, 
in the case of um, Russia. So he's an anti-communist, right? He he thinks that uh, he, he he refers to Stalin as a regime. He refer he refers to the Soviet project as a failure. He he refers to the liberalization of Russia as a failure, and he refers to fascism as a failure, right? Like he 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 doesn't think that any of these three are a way forward. Um, but what he does push forward is national unity and national identity um, to combat, and, and not just the national unity of Russian Russians in general, but the transnational unity of all different civilizations. And he talks about unifying with China, Russia, Africa, all, all of these people, I mean, nations to combat um, what we would call imperialism, but what he would call the Atlanticists, meaning Western Europe and, and the US. In fact, he even says that America is victim to this group. He says that the development of America was also interrupted in, right? You can, you can see, the, you can call that the indigenous peoples of, of America, right? Their own historical development was interrupted with settler colonialism, with this uh, Atlantic Western European project that came in and disrupted the civilizations of, of what is you know called North America. It replaced their knowledge systems, it replaced their medicine, it replaced their theories with like liberalism, really. And so he, he sees liberalism as like a great threat to the world. Um, and that liberalism is responsible for decimating all kinds of societies. Uh, Sue, can you pull up that quote? Oh, yeah. Yeah. The one you sent me? Yeah. Oh, yes, 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 yes. I have that. Uh, one second. So this, I pulled this quote from his book, The Fourth Political Theory. Um, oh, no. And I... Oh, there it is. Yeah. I think it captures the idea really well. So let me get rid of the whole thing so you can, sure. can see it. We need, to liberate, we need to liberate ourselves, all the peoples, Turkish people, Russian people, Chinese people, European people, American people, from this international liberal swamp. He's referring to the neoliberals here. Um, we need to liberate ourselves from the totalitarian discourse constructed on the self-evident dogma that only liberalism can be accepted as a universal ideology, that only Western values should be assimilated as something universal. So this ties really strongly to what we were just talking about even with like Chris Smalls, like we're taking the cultural values of the ruling class and pushing it onto people. And Dugan's kind of just universalizing this idea. Now continuing. With the growth of China and Putin's insistence on defending and strengthening Russian sovereignty, the Belt and Road Initiative which was transformed into something new in the last two years. It now represents a strategy to secure Chinese and Russian independence, working together in alliance. Now we can speak about the Russian-Chinese alliance as a geopolitical alliance opposed to the Atlanticist world order. He's referring to the neoliberals here. Nation states cannot independently establish, secure, and keep real sovereignty. We need to oppose this global pressure together. Above all, on the present stage, we need to establish a multipolar alliance between all the powers, all the states, all the countries and civilizations fighting for their independence. That is the logical conclusion of decolonization. Decolonization is not finished, it has just started. So obviously we talk about like as a Marxist, we always talk about how you know the global south the global south needs to unite to overthrow imperialism. Now Dugan's not coming from a Marxist Leninist perspective, so his language is different, right? He's not saying new liberals, he's saying Atlanticists. He's not saying the global south, right? He's saying um, you know, civilizations under the boot of the Atlanticists. But the point in the end is the same, right? And this is why China and Russia are very ideologically aligned right now. I think the reason why Dugin is so heavily studied in China is because obviously these ideas, you, you, you know, given these ideas, you can assume that Russia is using China for its own benefit. But obviously Russia is also using China for, for its own benefit. All global South nations have every impetus to unite together. And this was the main impetus of the 1950s um, conference in Indonesia, where all the decolonial movements came together, the Bangdung conference, they all came together and kind of strategize what needs to be done they said that we all need to economically unite right obviously the means to do that the material conditions to do that did not exist in the 1950s but china is creating those means right through the belt and road initiative and um you can see how dugan's ideas despite being anti-communist it's like he's framing the he, he's coming he's building a historical materialist perspective and anti-imperialist perspective from a completely different framework, like a framework outside of communism. 
But it's a framework that, in the end, is very dangerous to the ruling class. And Dugan himself dismisses Putin very often as a liberal Democrat. Um, and you can argue that Putin is a liberal Democrat. But Putin's geopolitical positions are very much in line with anti-imperialism, just like Dugan's world framework is, just like the Chinese uh, communist framework is, just like the Iranian Islamic um, Republic principles are. All of these are against one enemy, and they all tend to unite towards each other. You can pull the quote off now. Oh, but it's it's. I think it's useful to study him because it builds an anti-imperialist narrative from a completely different framework. Um, especially at, so after the fall of the Soviet Union, um, a lot of communist ways of thinking were pushed away. But you can see how the historical materialist tradition that was taught inside Russia continues on, even though the Soviet Union fell. Um, I, I, ideology tends to remain, and we should recognize that. Just like in the U.S. After slavery was abolished, the ideology of racism persisted. If China was to fall today, if the revolution was to fall today, the ideology of dialectic materialism inside China would continue. Um, you know, even Confuci Confucian ideas inside China continue, which is why, uh, in my opinion, they are so primed to be like very good dialecticians. But all that to say, we should study Dugin. I think Dugin has some good perspectives to put forward. I don't agree with him on everything. But you can see why and how um, his ideas are very popular in Russia, um, especially after the devastation that liberalization like put forward. Dugin very clearly points to an enemy for Russia, and that enemy is mm -hmm. going to be Western Europe and, and the U.S. And that's always going to be effective, especially when it comes to sort of political philosophy. Just right, right. Like, well, here's, here's the bad guy. Yeah. But yeah, I can see why he's such a dangerous thinker, too. To the ruling class, you know, um, he's a non-communist pushing ideas that communists would be pushing. Yeah, fair enough. The other, the other part is that, um, to your point, Hassan, and this is something that we discussed uh, before we went on on stream, is that uh, because people are afraid to wholeheartedly embrace communism, people will call themselves socialists, but they're afraid to call themselves communists. Um, I, I think the the soft s socialists do that because uh they're afraid of scaring people off due to optics yeah if you call yourself the communist then you immediately tie yourself to stalin and mao and famines and the hall of the more and so on and so on and so on because of this like because they don't either have the courage uh to counter argue with historical facts uh people who say that communism res is responsible for uh, you know a bazillion deaths uh, that it's an authoritarian, that it's a fascist, that it's a, uh, a totalitarian ideology, because they don't have the courage to do that, they're worried about what um, what thoughts they evoke in somebody else's mind when they say that. So when mm -hmm. somebody who espouses ideas that have already been um, that have already been floated, if not written about and heavily theorized by communists, when somebody does that, then they immediately have to run away from it. So you can call yourself a socialist while not abiding by any of the principles of socialism or the tenets of socialism or socialist thinkers that developed these ideas in the first place who called themselves communist. So mm -hmm. when somebody says something that sounds like something that would come out of Dugan's mouth, where Dugan himself is saying stuff that would have come out of, I don't know, uh, fucking Marx's mouth or come out of Lenin's mouth or come out mm -hmm. of Stalin's mouth, then mm -hmm. uh, people get mad at you for abiding by the very principles of the ideology that you espouse in the first place because of optics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this optics thing is a very big issue, I think, in the left. And we need to, and again, I, t I said this before, but the whole right-left thing, we need to step away from that frame of thinking. Um, it doesn't help us at all that we're creating a form of censorship that isn't like state-sanctioned, but it's like uh, sanctioned by our social circles or by the subculture of the left. Yeah. Right? Like, there, like, like, we know that there's this unspoken rule about who we are not allowed to read and who we should be reading. Right, but that's a, a bad way of going about it because not only will you build an echo chamber, but you'll build like a a prison of glass that you're sitting in, like an ideological prison. And like not only do you not know what exists outside of that prison, but like you're just reflecting your own ideas back and forth and just reaffirming what could possibly not reflect reality, right? Like ideology either reflects reality or it doesn't. Um 
some ideas do a good job of reflecting ideology, in my opinion, like dialectical materialism, and some ideologies don't do a good job. But when you don't like consider different perspectives and different frameworks and narratives, um, it's hard to challenge the ideology you may be stuck in. Like, you know, we were all socialized into liberalism, myself included. If I didn't go out of my way to read frameworks that I'm not allowed to be reading, like especially Marxism, um, or or challenging postmodernist ideas, like it, I, I wouldn't, I would have just validated my own ideas without knowing it. Yeah, I mean, I was I was attacked in a major newspaper for uh, telling environmentalists that they should be reading Marx and that right. they should at least understand yeah. anti-capitalism, if not try to incorporate that into their into their their politic. Right, the Marxy OG, like ecologist, right, like the yeah. original. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, I, I you know, I, I brought it up because uh, you know somebody who was uh, friends with people in Extinction Rebellion uh, hit me up and said, "Hey, like, you know, what are some, um, what are some socialist works that I can uh, bring to other people in Extinction Rebellion?" And I said, "Well, have they been reading Marx? Have they been reading Engels?" Uh, mm -hmm. And they're like, "Well, no, you know, they're 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 not like um, ideological like that." And I'm like. But they're not? Like, environmentalists. What do you mean? I know. I what know. Do you exactly. mean? So you're willing to you're willing to you're willing to go ahead and like um have these disruptive protests where people are like you know running half naked through the streets or like uh um uh, like spray painting uh walls, uh linking arms, getting arrested. You're willing to do all that, but you're not willing to fucking read Marx. Like that, what does that tell mm -hmm. you? Mm -hmm. So when I when I said that and I wrote this in, in McLean's magazine, I said like for people on the left, you need like you can't just call yourself an anti-capitalist. You have to go to the source. You have to read the actual theory in order to apply it. You cannot apply theory without understanding what that theory mm -hmm. is. And for that, um, Brian Lilly, a writer for the Toronto Sun, uh, wrote a column attacking me, saying, "Wow, Good this seems to be this amazing, yeah, exactly, this amazing resurgence of of uh, Marxism happening in Canada. And do do you know what Marxism is responsible for?" Right. I was like, right. and it was, it was one of the worst written articles. I didn't even respond to it. I was like, this Sounds is bad. Tra yeah, I was like, this is trash way below, like yeah. way below my regard. He actually ended up getting laughed at by his peers, but like, it, it's just, it's, it's wild to me that people are that cowardly or at least like that mm -hmm. scared to, yeah. even if you don't identify with communism, because you're not sure what communism even is at the very least, like as, as somebody who is a communist, like I'm a member of the communist party of Canada and a member for, of black Alliance for peace, which is a pan-African communist organization. I, I am not just reading socialist writers and thinkers. I am also reading right-wing reactionaries. I am also reading social Democrats. I am reading neoliberals. I am reading people and thinkers and writers of all varieties in order to engage in the process of dialectical materialism. If mm -hmm. I'm not doing that, then I'm stagnant. And I think that that's what people on the left need to understand is that if you're afraid to read somebody or if you're afraid to say, and I don't even really think it's because they're actually afraid. I think what it is, is just straight up laziness. Like any excuse that they can give themselves for not reading uh, a particular thinker or doing or engaging in a, in a particular line of study, any, any reason that they can give themselves to get off the hook for having to do the homework, they'll take it immediately. And it's like, I, I'm sorry, but I have no, I have no sympathy for that. I've got, I've got my full-time job. I've also got this work uh, with the culture.tv. I'm also married. I have two young children that are four years old. I'm a grad student and yet I have time to do this side work. So what the fuck is your excuse? It's, it's not just laziness too. I do think that the ruined class through culture, through media, through academia kind of puts certain thinkers into ideological wells and says that this is bad. And if you engage with it, you're like a bad person, right? And yeah. a lot of people, a lot of people end up falling into that trap. And that's another reason why, for example, people like won't read Stalin, right? Like e even Stalin, who is, I think is a very good writer, a very clear writer. Um, like people just don't want to engage with him. And I, thankfully things changed with Lenin. I think at some point it was like that with Lenin. Um, even like Palestine, like 10 years ago, you couldn't use the word Palestine publicly without being like, attacked. Mm -hmm. I think some things have changed with, with talking about Palestine, same, same thing with China. Because uh, I remember five years ago, talking about China was the same thing, right? Like, or praising China in any way was like, dismissed, even by people in the in the communist wing of the US. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, I, I, in the end, you know, if you do want to study someone, I do suggest that you just go to the direct source. Because anytime you 
read i mean even like me like I, i'm talking about dugan and telling you like giving my opinion of him i could be coming from it with a bias right it's still useful to read the original original writer and this is what kwame Ture stressed he says if you're not engaging with the actual material you're thinking about thinking about someone you're not actually thinking about someone.